So welcome to our 37th uh, annual Alderson event. Tonight is about celebrating the Department of Kinesiology and Health <coughs> Education and our dedication to research, teaching, and service that is designed to impact the lives in a positive way of the people of the state of Texas, the nation, and the world. And we talk about that as our mission, and a lot of people think that seems like, you know, that's pretty lofty. It seems like a stretch, but I will tell you uh, that we have graduates who every day are having that kind of impact uh, and, and really are a credit to the work that the faculty are doing here and the work that the students are doing. And I will assure you that in 25 years to come, you will look back on the careers of many of these students and be just as impressed with the work that they're doing. And, and, and who knows, maybe um, I certainly won't be the part of chair at that time. And whoever is chair at that time will be extolling the virtues of their careers and what they've done and how they've taken what they've learned here and carried it forward to be able to impact the health of the nation, human performance, and the experience of sport that individuals have. And so it, it is really at moments like this where we step back, recognize the excellence of our students, both present and former, recognize the excellence of our faculty, that it really, for me, and I know for the staff and the rest of the faculty, uh, is a moment where we reflect on our mission and really how blessed we are to have a role in that and to be able to serve that mission. And it, it's really why uh, the Alderson event is my favorite night of the year at work. And so uh, hopefully you get a good sense of some of the work that we do uh, and the impact that we can have. Now, the final example I'll give of one of our graduates living out our mission is tonight's speaker, Nate Boyer. After joining the Army in 2005, Nate earned his Green Beret in 2006, serving tours in both Iraq and Afghanistan. In 2010, while still serving, he came to the University of Texas where he walked onto the football team because, you know, that's what you do, right? Uh, Green Beret, uh, varsity football player at a Division I college, you know, uh, that's how I spend my spare time. To no one's surprise, he was a standout special teams player and academic All-American, and has since become something of a world traveler, philanthropist, community leader, and if you look at the, uh, the name tag uh, that the football team gave him uh, today, as he was a practice certified bad ass. Uh, <laughs> and we are so thankful uh, to have him as one of our graduates and to have him here tonight to be able to share his story. And so uh, please join me in welcoming Nate Boyd. I guess I'm, I don't know if I'm, I'm mic'd up or maybe I should just use this. Is this better? Yeah. All right, let's use this. Doesn't matter. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Appreciate that. Um, yeah, I'm like the king of dad jokes. This isn't even a joke, but I feel like, uh, oh, by the way, John Arnold standing back there. I just got back from uh, Tanzania last month. Uh, group of, of veterans and former NFL players climbing Mount Kilimanjaro for a clean water uh, project. John uh, was in the 101st Airborne and uh, sacrificed quite a bit for us. He's a below the knee amputee. Um, not only summited Kilimanjaro, but a big part of the, uh, uh, you know, the push to provide East Africans with clean water, but also just a really good friend of mine. And on the last day of the climb, we're heading down the hill. I think John's, th are you 39? He's 40. One of the guides walking up asked if John was my son and was like dead serious. He's like, he's your son? I thought I was like a language barrier thing. <laughs> nope. Anyway, love you, brother. Uh, not just John, a lot of the uh, faculty and administration here, um, it's weird because they're you know, professors, doctors, but I, like, I call them like Tolga and Matt and Tommy and Rich and Jessica, and I'm knocking stuff over, Jessica Silva, and Mike Sanders, and all these people, uh, friends of mine. So it's just really cool to, uh, to be in this room with all these people, I get to see them and catch up, uh, and to be a part of this. And it's, it's the 37th, and I was number 37, so you know. <laughs> it had to be this year, dad joke. Not even a joke, just whatever. Um, but seriously, uh, it was an honor to go to school here uh, it's an honor to be alumni and to be able to come back and, and just sh you know, share a little bit about my journey uh, with you guys today. So uh, thank you for that and, and congratulations to all the honorees. That's really cool. Um, yeah, so how I got here was interesting. I, I didn't, uh, not from Texas, I'm from the Bay Area in California. 
Um, didn't grow up a Longhorn fan. Kind of grew up a Notre Dame fan, to be honest. Uh, I was a Niner fan. And Joe Montana went to Notre Dame. And, you know, the Niners were really good back then. I was a huge Jerry Rice and Ronnie Lott fan. And um, anyway, that, that's, who I was, that's who I rooted for. And then when I was in the Army, I remember in, uh, in 2006, during the national championship game, I actually pulled for USC because I was from California which is really sad. I know no one even laughed at that. Everyone was like, wow, <laughs> that is awful. Um, so I'll back up a couple years before that. 2004, uh, I, I was living in Los Angeles, you know, th three years after 9-11. Um, I was 23 years old and I, I, I'd worked all kinds of different odd jobs. You know, I was working, uh, I was working some with autistic kids at the time, which was incredible. I, I learned a lot about uh, patience and respect and understanding for people that see things a little bit different, uh, but that also have a great amount of value and, uh, you know, just as intelligent and, um, and interesting and, and uh, I guess, capable of anyone in my eyes. I learned that, you know, through that time spent with them. But other than that, I mean, I just, I, I, I partied a lot. I didn't really have a purpose or direction. I had no idea who I wanted to be, where I wanted to, you know, where I saw myself in five years, 10 years, 50 years. And it just was like, I guess like people call it a quarter life crisis. I don't know. I just, I was in this rut in a, in a you know, it was probably depression. I don't know, I don't know if that's clinically what it was, but it was just, I didn't feel like I made a, uh, any difference to anybody in the world except for you know, myself and, and maybe, you know, some of those kids, hopefully. Um, and I kind of just was at my wit's end. And, and I remember this, uh, a friend of mine, he brought uh, this Time Magazine article over to, uh, to the apartment I was staying at and like showed this thing to me. His buddy had been an assistant photog photographer on this trip. And this, this, uh, the head photographer had taken him out to the Darfur in Sudan um, along the border of Chad. Uh, it's in, it was in the, in the midst of this genocide where there had already been 300,000 killed. Um, and, it, you know, these refugee camps are just full of women, women and children. And, you know, for me at first, I was, I was just shocked that something like that existed in the world today. I, I couldn't believe uh, that that went on. I mean, I grew up, very fortunately, grew up in this country, which, yeah, we're not perfect, but it's pretty good here. You know, we have to admit we got a lot of good things going. And, there's a lot of good people here, and, um, and I just, you know, I guess I just took that for granted. I didn't understand, um, even though I knew it existed, I didn't really, uh, I, I, I definitely didn't know what that looked like, and I wanted to, I wanted to help in some way. And so I called every NGO, uh, non-governmental organization like Doctors Without Borders, Child Fund, Catholic Relief Services, and none of them would let me come volunteer because I didn't have a college degree. Uh, in their eyes, they didn't have any special skills. And I was like, look, I, I will do whatever. I will dig ditches. I, I will assist in the refugee camps in any way. Just let me help, uh, please. And they all said no. So uh, for the first time in my life, I, I felt like no was not acceptable. I wasn't going to take that. Uh, and so I went to um, the AAA travel agency, which no one even uses those hardly anymore, except I think Tolga's family owns one. But uh, we, uh, I went there and I bought a pl plane ticket to the neighboring country of Chad. And I flew over there and just figured it out once I got there. And it completely changed my life. I was only there for two months. Um, I talked my way onto a UN plane once I was in country and got out to the camps, got uh, interrogated, <laughs> all kinds of stuff. Because they were like, well, who are you and what are you doing here? And I was like, I just want to help. I just want to be a, a part of helping uh, somebody out here because you're obviously understaffed and, and this is just crazy that this is happening right now. And I live in a country where I'm you know, very fortunate to have everything that I have and I just want to, I just want to be here to help. And so they eventually, uh, they, let me, they let me volunteer there for uh, you know, six weeks at the camps. And like I said, it completely changed me. The kids, um, all the people there, just how grateful they were. Uh, and just appreciative to have a glass of water and a meal that day and maybe some medical care if they, if they needed it. 
and that was it. And the soccer ball, you know, the kids, the whole, all the kids, they just needed one soccer ball and they were good. And, uh, and maybe you want to fight for people like that, you know, to, to fight for those that can't fight for themselves is sort of a mantra that I'm, I've tried to live by ever since uh, that, that time I spent there. So my last week in country, I actually got malaria and uh, was really sick and I, and I was, they put me up in this cot and this, this local family was like giving me this medicine, I don't know what it was, but uh, I was starting to feel a little bit better, but I was still just, you know, I was a mess. And there's this little radio I was listening next to the, the cot every, every day. Uh, it was a BBC channel and it was like the play-by-play, -play, basically, of uh, the first Battle of Fallujah. And, you know, it, it, I don't know if it was the drugs or the malaria or just, you know, that, that calling um, that I decided I was going to join the military when I came back to the States. And so I came back and I started looking into the different branches, the different jobs that were available, and I found out about the Army Special Forces. And um, De Oppresso Liber, which is what I used at the end, the, the, the bottom of the two open letters that I've, that I've written, which I'll get to, um, is the motto of the Special Forces. And it stands for to free the oppressed. And for me, that just felt like something I wanted to live by. You know, I wanted to be a part of freeing the oppressed um, in some way. And uh, I found out that the, the Green Berets, everything they do is by, with, and through indigenous forces, whether you're in Iraq, Afghanistan, Timbuktu, wherever. Uh, you live with those people, you fight alongside them, you train with them, you know, they become your brothers in arms. And that was a big deal for me, that, 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 that mission. So I signed up, I went off to basic training, not really knowing what I was getting into. And, uh, and I got through it, you know, because of, I had this passion and this desire to just be a part of that unit at all costs, no matter what it took. And, uh, you know, it's a year and a half of training, and it's extremely difficult. Um, but I made it. I got my Green Beret, you know, and I, and I, and I got to serve my country. And, and I'm not going to you know, get into the, you know, the, the combat side of things and talk about all that because it's a, that's a long, long story. Dr. Todd, too. Sorry. Just saw you there. I didn't get to see you. So she gets doctor. Everybody else's first name basis. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and yeah, so I get, I, I, I get done with my active duty service. I have a, a, an option to re-enlist. Um, and I decided to, uh, to come back to school. And I would eventually transition into the Texas National Guard uh, and, and continue to serve while I was back here at school. Um, but not just coming to school, I wanted to do the one thing that I never did growing up and totally regretted, which was playing football. Um, I played other sports growing up. Football just never seemed to work out, and it was my favorite sport, and it just killed me that I never played. And so I got to school, and I just decided I was going to try out for the team, and, and, uh, you know, and I went out, and um, I, I, I walk on tryouts. I was just talking to Jaron Nicholson. There he is. We played on the team together. Like the first day of tryouts, I didn't really know the deal. You know, it's like coach says run, or the strength coach says run, you know, four laps around the field or whatever. I like took off in a dead sprint and just like beat everybody, um, like, you know, passing out at the end of it. And uh, that was not what we were supposed to do, but I just figured if I did that every day, there's no way they can cut me. So that was like the, <laughs> that was sort of the goal. Uh, and I was fortunate enough to make the team and then you know, find a way on the field via long snapping, which is a thankless job. And I did, did plenty of those in the military, but uh, I just wanted to be a part of this thing, you know, and I wanted to not only be a part of the university, um, and I would not only be a part of the, the team in the locker room, but I wanted to, like, make a difference on the field, too, in some way. And, uh, and it, was, it, was, it was awesome to have that experience. And then for, for Coach Brown and, and even Coach Strong my last year to, to let me go back overseas and, and go back to Afghanistan and continue to serve my country while I was playing was huge for me. You know, I'd, I'd leave for about three months every summer and then uh, come back and, and play football. And I loved it. It was, you know, it was, it was huge to me. Uh, and uh, I got done with college and I had an opportunity uh, in the training camp with the Seattle Seahawks, which was very fortunate, you know, and it didn't last very long. I played in one game, in a preseason game. But I did great. <laughs> and then I got cut two days later. <laughs> um, but it was, it was awesome. That was a great, 
that was a great journey, a great story for me, and, and I felt like that could have been a great ending to the Nate Boyer saga, whatever that is. Um, but I, I'm always looking for new challenges. I always want um, to stay purposeful and, 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 and make a difference in some way and, and change the world like we, like we do when we go to Texas. Um, and in the next, the next year during spring training, or excuse me, during the preseason, um, I wasn't on a football team, but uh, there was a guy that a few of you people may have heard about named Colin Kaepernick um, that was sitting on the bench during uh, the national anthem. And I didn't understand why uh, it hurt me to see that. And at first I was just really upset, really angry. I wanted to just uh, lash out about it. And, you know, I think do what a lot of people have been doing in this country on both sides of any argument, prove, you know, tell people why they're wrong, why I'm right, and, and, and do it in, an, in, a, in a disrespectful or hurtful way. Um, and it's just not the answer. You know, it didn't feel right to f even feel those things, to even think about that. And uh, so instead, I, I decided to write an open letter to Colin, explaining my experiences, but also thinking about my time in Afghanistan and Iraq with autistic kids, um, with the people in Darfur, you know, all those difference, differences in cultures and customs and religions and beliefs and everything. Um, and understand that my viewpoint is not the only viewpoint. And I can, I can believe something wholeheartedly and feel, you know, so morally um, strong in a certain way. And it doesn't mean it's the only way. And it doesn't mean that I'm necessarily right or wrong. It's not a right or wrong issue. Uh, it's just our experiences that dictate what we believe. And uh, so instead I wrote, this, I wrote this letter. And I think the reason it became such a thing was because a lot of people were feeling the same as I was in our country. You know, there was no sense of reason anymore. There was no listening. There was no, maybe I don't agree with you, but uh, I'd like to hear your side on why, why you believe that, why you think that way. Uh, and then when you're done talking, if you want to hear my side, I'd love to share that too. And Colin and I ended up sitting down and having a conversation the day of that game, uh, the last preseason game of the, of the year. And, we met in the lobby of the team hotel. He wanted to sit down and kind of pick my brain about things, and I wanted to meet him and, and you know, hear about why he was doing what he was doing. And we met for like an hour and a half in the team hotel, literally four hours before kickoff. And we didn't agree about everything, um, but we were, there was a lot of smiling. <laughs> uh, we were appreciative of each other, and uh, at least in those moments, you know, grateful for someone to listen to our side of things. And we kind of came to this middle ground or idea that's sort of together um, of doing something different that night. Uh, you know, he, he didn't want to hurt people that wore the military uniform or uh, people that felt a certain way about the flag and the anthem, that were patriotic, that weren't, uh, um, that were good people, you know. He wanted to show that he was willing to listen to in some way and, and be respectful in some way. And so I suggested maybe, um, he'd take a knee. You know, I wanted him to stand with me. He wanted to sit. And I thought, you know what, I think that's a more respectful way. I think being alongside your teammates is important more than anything. I, you know, people take a knee to pray. Um, they take a knee to propose. Take a knee to do a lot of things. And usually it's a sign of respect. And he thought that was a really good idea. And, uh, and so that night he, he asked if I would kneel with him. I told him I can't do that because of, of my service, and, and I just don't want to, to be honest, but I'll stand next to you if you do that, if you, if you kneel tonight, and, and he did, and uh, yeah, it was a big, uh, it, was, it was an important, it was an important part of my life, really, uh, and, you know, things continue to evolve and devolve <laughs> in our society uh, through this, this time, it's a, it's a, it's a weird time to be American, but it's an important time. And uh, I think if we can focus more on those moments uh, where two people, you know, maybe don't see eye to eye on something, but have that same respect for one another and at least willingness to listen and, and, uh, and, and yeah, be respectful, then we can head in the right direction again. And uh, I'm not getting into politics, though.
not, not talk, I don't want to talk about politics and I don't ever want to be in, in politics. Uh, but hopefully that inspired somebody that will run for office one day uh, to kind of you know, have that same type of, of mindset as well. And so once again, um, thank you for, for letting me join you. Uh, thank you, the University of Texas, for letting me be a part of this and for really changing me uh, in so many ways. This, this part of my journey was a really important one. And, uh, and Austin, as you guys know, is the greatest city in America, so I love to come. It's the greatest city in the world, probably. Uh, I always love to come back, and, uh, and I'm just very grateful to, to be here and be able to share with you guys. So God bless Texas, and God bless America. Thank you very much. Do I come back down? Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Oh yeah, I'm an idiot. I, I I was supposed to say I was supposed to say before, prepare your questions, and I totally forgot. <laughs> Thank you, Tolga. Sorry. And nobody's got one. See, that's why I was supposed to do it before. So people, that's uh. all right. Cool. Hi there. After your active duty, what made you decide on UT instead of the West Coast team? Oh, man. Well, I, I mean, I thought about going back to school in California. I live back in California now, uh, mostly, and I mean, I love California. But I knew, first of all, I knew Texas was really good to, to its veterans. You know, I hadn't been a veteran yet. It would be my first time, kind of, you know, not, not in full-time active service, at least. And, uh, but also, I mean, I came and visited Austin and, and the university, and it was just, like, Perfect. When I walked on campus, I went to, I came up here during, uh, it was like a, during the summer, and they had uh, like a youth football camp out on the practice fields. And I met uh, Coach Madden, Jeff Madden, Mad Dog, the old strength coach, you know, and he was like, you get, you get around a lot of coaches in the, in the sports world at high levels, and a lot of them, you know, I don't know, they don't seem to give people the time of day. Uh, it's, it's a common thing. I never felt that for a second at Texas. Uh, he was so welcoming. Coach Rucker, uh, Ken Rucker, who was up here, used to coach at Air Force. He came and showed me around campus. He said, come back, come back this year for a game and we'll, we'll take care of, you know, come see a game and like, yeah. And then, you know, he's like, you still got to try out for the team. And I'm not saying, you know, he's still got to walk on and give it a shot. But so like from the football side of that, it was great. And then, you know, coming up here, I mean, meeting, meeting Richard and, and, and Jessica, I think I met them maybe in that fall before I came here um, and just sort of just made a plan and, and I don't know. I, did, I, I, I visited other places, but I didn't apply anywhere else. I just knew, I just had a feeling, you know, and I mean, just like I said about Austin, it was just, it's such a cool town um, and, and, I, and I love the idea of, I knew I was going to be an older student, 10 years older than most of the freshmen. Um, I was afraid to go to a small college town where if I didn't quite jive with the younger folks, you know, would that just be awkward for me to live in that town? I ended up like all my friends were in college and 10 years younger than me when I went here anyway. You know, I, I stopped maturing at like 19, just like Tolga, so. Uh, what? What? Anyway, thank you. Yes, sir. What position did you play and did you have any injuries? Uh, I walked on as a safety, and it turns out I'm pretty slow, uh, unfortunately. So I started long snapping, and I, and I taught myself to long snap, um, and uh, that's how I found my way on the field. Um, I did have some, nothing crazy, I never had like a crazy surgery or anything like that, but every year I had something, and I don't know if that was wear and tear from the military or just age, and, and then you get hit by somebody that's way more athletic than you out on the field. Um, and so I had, you know, I had a rib thing one year, a shoulder thing one year, and a, a hip flexor thing that's kind of wrote, translated to my lower back and still bothers me quite a bit. Um, but I can't complain. I wouldn't trade it. <laughs> it was, yeah, it's totally worth it. Definitely not gracefully. Um, yeah, that's really the top. People didn't hear that. That's a, it's a good question about. She said, "I feel like I've 
would you kind of say like live different lives sort of <laughs> or whatever? Yeah, but just transitioning into these very different uh, aspects of my life, I guess. Because um, I feel like there's still a bunch more to come. And I don't know if it's, for some reason, it's, it's always seemed to follow this like four to six year phase and then I kind of go and do something else. And it's not like I leave the past behind me completely. I kind of carry all that stuff with me. But I just, I love new challenges. I love, um, I love getting involved in something that I'm not sure I can do. I'm not sure I'm going to be good at. Something that not a lot of people want to do maybe. Or maybe a lot of people want to do but they're scared to try. Um, and it's not that I have like no fear of failure. I definitely, I'm like everybody else, I'm like insecure and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm afraid it's not going to work out, all those things. But I also know, and I think it's through a lot of my experiences, that if you really want to do something, and you're really passionate about it, that's all that matters. You should be willing to sacrifice quite a bit to make that happen and work at it every day instead of just dream about it. You know? I think growing up I dreamed about things a lot, which is also good, you should dream. But I didn't uh, apply <laughs> the dreams to my life and like work towards it because I probably because I was afraid if I put all this time and energy into something that doesn't work out, I'm a failure. But that's not true at all. I mean, things never are going to work out the way you plan them anyway, ever. They're always the you know the universe takes its path and you just kind of go along for the ride. Um, but I, I'm just. I don't know, I, I, love, I love the idea of proving people wrong, <laughs> you know, all that stuff. Just, it just gets me excited thinking about uh, whatever, whatever next adventure um, I may get into. And, I, and like, I don't even know what my next thing is right now, but I know it'll come uh, if I keep just you know, kind of putting myself out there and working towards stuff. It, it, they, they always seem to pop up. Uh, but I think everybody has those feelings. Everybody has things that they're interested in, they're passionate about. Or maybe regrets, like the football thing was kind of a regret that I never did, and I was like, I can do, I can do it. Like, why not now? You know, I think the guy I found out the guy that took all those pictures in that article in Time Magazine. I'm, I'm eventually I'm going to meet him. Um, I don't think he took his first professional picture until he was like in his late 30s or something like that. And like that magazine like changed my life. You know what I mean? So like it's crazy to think about that ripple effect and the idea that. You know, if he would have kept doing whatever he was doing that wasn't what he really wanted, maybe I wouldn't have done any of this stuff. I don't know. So, uh, whatever it is, moving forward, I think everybody, we're capable of a lot and we have so many opportunities here uh, that you're crazy if you're, not, if you're not going after, you know, that dream or that passion. And you know, the crazy, the real, actually, you're not crazy. Yeah, you're crazy if you're not. Yes. Because the crazy person is the one that never does it. The crazy person is that the one that lives their life safe all the time and is afraid to fail or make the mistake and they're just comfy. Like, that's crazy to me. That would drive me crazy, you know. I, I don't feel like I'm crazy for going to these crazy places. I feel like that's normal because <laughs> that's what interests me, so, yeah. Or you went first and then you're next. <laughs> oh, sorry. Can you compare, can you contrast your experience in leadership when you're in the military versus when you're on the football team you see? Yeah, I mean, I think I was much less a leader and more led <laughs> when I was in the military. Um, at least at the beginning, I mean, I was a younger guy to the team, you know, new. It's so many, like, mentors, and they weren't necessarily always high-ranking officers or anything. Sometimes it was my peers in the military that kind of led me, inspired me, taught me a lot. Um, I thought the, 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 the coolest lessons I learned about what great leadership is uh, to me are, are when people, you know, they call it, jokingly, they call it in the military, the three D's of leadership, decide, delegate, and disappear. <laughs> the ones that didn't disappear. <laughs> the ones that made decisions, you know, they delegated, and then they picked the worst job or the hardest job for themselves. You know, or they did that hardest job alongside somebody else. Those are the best leaders. You know, everyone talks about actions, but it's the ones that really are fully involved uh, with whatever the mission is, whether it's you know, going after a high-value target or cleaning the latrines. <laughs> doesn't matter. Uh, those were the best leaders to me. And then here at Texas, something that I was, I was nervous about doing that, coming into a locker room, first of all, 
I'm on the scout team. I'm all these years old, older than these guys. I got all these life experience, but I'm on the scout team, you know, and I'm not starting anything. Um, so I had to keep some of that, try to be as humble as I could in that and understand even though this kid's 19 or whatever, he sort of outranks me in some way uh, because of what he does on the field. And I need to do what I can to support the leadership. Um, and then through that, I think it helped me become a better leader because and then people want to listen to you and they want to, they, they start picking your brain about things and they start appreciating your experience because you didn't come into the room like, hey, I'm a Green Beret. You know, everybody needs to pay attention to me, listen to me and I've got everything to share and you don't know anything because you're just a college kid. Um, so I think that, that helped me learn how to be a leader. I'm still learning. I don't really know what I'm doing half the time, but um, yeah, I think that the, both those things are important. Kind of putting yourself, you know, on everybody else's level because we're all, we're all the same, we're made of the same stuff. So. Yeah, uh, what lessons uh, from your service have uh, kept with you most? Um, I guess the best one I can tell you is, I mean, I learned a lot, obviously, but um, a good buddy of mine named Brad, who, who unfortunately passed away in 2012, this guy was the ultimate mentor for me. Uh, in the end, he's only a couple years older than me. Uh, he, you know, worked his way up the ranks in the military from, you know, being a, um, you know, strictly a, uh, a supply guy to, you know, one of the most elite Green Berets ever. And uh, what was really cool about his story is that, you know, he was married before, he was really young, it didn't work out, it wasn't something, he, I don't think he was ready and whatever. You know, he's this guy, I'll never get married again. And then he meets this girl and she has a child with severe disabilities. And Brad like fell in love with the kid almost well, kind of before he fell in love with Lisa, who would be his wife. Um, and he just knew like this is the right thing to do. This is what I'm supposed to do now with my life. You know, like, like that kind of stuff. You know, people that have that. I, I, I don't know if I have that in me. I wish I, I could say that I did, but I don't know if I do. Um, to put people like that so far ahead of you, um, I learned a ton from Brad, you know, and I still I wear a bracelet that says, what would Brad do on it <laughs> every day because, you know, I always want to remember him and the type of guy that he was. But, I mean, there's so many people like that, not in the military, just in, in all of our lives, you know, and I think that they don't always get, they don't get to speak in front of people like I do. Um, and they don't get the appreciation that they deserve, but, like, those are honestly, like, the real heroes. It's not, no offense to... Medal of Honor recipients and all that. I love those guys and they've done heroic things, but like to me, someone like that is like that's incredible. It doesn't, you know, it has nothing to do with the camouflage that he wore, you know what I mean? So that's just yeah, one example I can give you. So Dr. Todd gets the last one. All right. Uh -oh. Do you even have a final one? exam? Huh? Do you even have a final exam? Oh, no, no. Well, actually, I did teach you. I know. Is this another 40 page paper? I think that's what's going <laughs> So, can I, can I do a little personal note about, about yeah. being your instructor? So in a sport history class as an undergraduate that I taught Nate, and I didn't know him before the class, I give them an assignment for them to write a term paper in sport history. And pretty much I get Jackie Robinson, and I get Babe Ruth, and I get all these very mundane things. And there's a lot of repetition, not to disparage any of the undergrads, because I don't <laughs> teach the sport history class anymore, Dr. Beckwith does. But Nate came in and actually did write almost a 40 page paper for me, which he did by digging into all kinds of private papers and personal records about military training and interviewing people about how we use exercise in, in, to prepare our soldiers. And I was thinking today when we had lunch and about how sort of an extraordinary day it is that we honor two people who came to UT for their PhDs who now work in preparing soldiers and keeping them healthy and active. You came in and, and did your military service first and then sort of came back to us. Um, but I was obviously really impressed with you as a student and I think that the quality of leadership and perseverance that you showed then continues to lead you. And, um, and I think the, the last thing that I wanted to say was you've been very quiet about where you're going and I'm just wondering like, What's Nate Boyer's bucket list? So if, the, if it's those challenges that you're after, what's next? All right, that's a fair question. I hate answering those though, because then it puts me on the hook, you know, but that's, hey, we have to do that. We gotta hold 
ourselves accountable and let other people hold us accountable too, to our dreams. Um, something that you know, I, I've also been very interested in for a long time and what I've always wanted to be involved in is, uh, you know, is, is, is making, making content in the film and television world, right? And when I first moved to Los Angeles, that was the reason I moved out there. I was interested in the film industry. I had no idea what I wanted to do, and I ended up doing nothing back then. Um, but now, it's sort of full circle, and I'm back there. And if I could do anything in the industry, what I eventually want to do is, um, I mean, everybody wants to tell powerful stories, right? Um, but I want to try to attach the cause that that story is telling, if you know, a uh, better way I put that is, I basically want to make, uh, want to make films that, that, that benefit um, some, of these, some of these causes, some of these nonprofits in the world that, you know, we tell these stories about, whether it's from a simple side in the military, you know, there's a lot of movies about PTSD, but what are they actually doing? What are they actually helping besides just to tell that story, which is important, um, but when, I make that movie or, you know, one day when it's, it's one about, uh, you know, the, the, the child soldiers in Africa, we're actually doing something. Uh, part of the mission is to, to help that problem, to fix that problem, to be a part of that. And, and I want people to know when they go see that movie or, or whatever it is, that documentary, just by them going, they're helping, you know, not just by learning about it, but they're, part of that is going to the cause. And that's a tough sell in Hollywood. <laughs> Because everyone's worried about their bottom line and movies are risky and all that, but I'm going to figure a way out to do it. You know, that, that's what I want to do um, for now. <laughs> but that'll definitely change. But that's, that's, that's one of the things I'm very passionate about. And then beyond that, what I've been working in now and what I love is, is uh, being able to work in the nonprofit space. I mean, be able to be a part of that Clean Water Project I talked about. And I've got a, a nonprofit called MVP, which stands for Merging Vets and Players. Um, and we're bringing together former professional athletes and combat veterans and helping them find a purpose once the uniform comes off. And uh, yeah, all, all, of, all of those things, integrating all of those things, you know. I, I, I actually recently wrote, uh, co-wrote, I'm not really a writer, I might be, but that's what I said to Matt and, <laughs> Matt and Tolga last night, I was like, I'm the idea guy, you know. Uh, I, <laughs> I'm not a talented writer, but I'm working with one. And we're, we're, we read, wrote a story about this former NFL player and this, this veteran that lives in a homeless shelter in Hollywood. And it's a true, the true story about the veteran. And there's a guy I know that he works for MVP now. He's one of our employees. But he was living in a, a homeless shelter with Iraq and Afghan veterans all in this shelter. And they're all young guys. And they, a lot of them, you know, did some crazy things in the military. And, like, that's a real issue. Like, that's really going on. Well, not only do I want to make, make a movie about that story, I want those guys to not only be in the movie, I want them to be behind the camera, I want them to make the movie about, you know, telling their own story. So stuff like that, you know, it's, it's, that's what inspires, that's what gets me excited. I can blabber on about that for hours. But thank you for asking that, doctor. <laughs> cool. Once again, thank you guys. Sorry, I forgot to tell you about the question prep. That's my bad. Tolga bailed me out, like he often does. Um, but thank you again. Um, how come?